What I want to go through over the next uh, couple lectures with you is um, is some tissue mechanics um, and looking at some of the uh, passive structural elements um, in, in the body. And we're not gonna we're not gonna go through um, the mechanics of, of all of these different tissues, but we'll at least get a start on looking at. Uh, how they're structured, how they are able to uh, sustain sustain load, and um, and some of the relationships uh, there there are between. So when when we talk about passive structural elements, um, there's there's four sort of notable ones that that really jump to mind. So we've got uh, bones, um, and everybody knows what bones are, of course. Uh, cartilage, um, and I really should have made a note here that um, we've got two types of cartilage that we can talk about, right? We can talk about um, articular cartilage, which is the stuff on the end of your long bones, right, that helps your uh, joints articulate, and then there's also fibrocartilage, um, too. And uh, fibrocartilage um, is, um, is what the intervertebral discs that separate the vertebrae of your spine are made of. Um, so we've got both of, uh, both of, both of those uh, there, as well as fibrocartilage being present at the places where um, your ligaments and your tendons uh, meet, your, meet your bones. Um, so then we've got ligaments and we've got uh, tendons as well. So those four, uh, four different structural tissues. And all of these have in common that they are all built using uh, this material called collagen. And, um, and you've probably heard a little bit about collagen in the, um, in the lectures that you've had so far in this course. So what we're going to do talking about tissue mechanics, um, we're going to do a little bit talking about tissues first and then we'll talk a little bit about basic mechanics uh, first as well because that's probably something that a lot of you haven't had a lot of exposure uh, to or at least maybe it's been quite a while since you took first year physics. Um, so we'll talk about tissues, we'll talk about uh, mechanics and then we'll talk about tissue uh, mechanics together and we'll, we'll see how we go. Um, so collagen uh, first. So all of those uh, four structural tissues that I had on the previous slide, they are all based on different arrangements of collagen fibrils, okay? And collagen fibrils are really little nanoscale uh, fibers of collagen that are arranged in different ways to, to make up these tissues. To give you a sense of scale here, they're, they're sort of range between uh, 50 to 250, 300 nanometers in diameter. So that's about uh, one one thousandth the thickness of, um, of one of your hairs, right? So these are, these are really, really fine little fibers. Okay, so collagen, we'll talk a little bit about the way um, collagen um, fibrils are actually made. And, and let me know too if you, you know, if I'm moving too fast um, or, uh, or if you can't hear me, um, etc. cetera. Um, so collagen fibrils are, um, are an arrangement of collagen molecules. And this, this is what a, sort of a collagen molecule um, in its schematic form sort of looks like. Um, they are long slender structures. So they're sort of, uh, let's see, about um, a nanometer and, uh, oh, let's get that here, a nanometer and a half in diameter there. And in terms of length, go all the way over to the other end, and find where we are. They're about 300 nanometers long. Okay. Triple helical molecules 
uh, three polypeptide chains that are bound together by hydrogen bonds. Okay, so what we have in, uh, in this picture here is a figure showing how collagen molecules come together to form a fibril. And you can see the start of one collagen molecule sort of there and how it winds its way um, sort of along a tortuous path um, and uh, how, it, how it comes together with other collagen molecules to start to form uh, higher order structures. Okay? Um, so notably, there's, there's a very regular arrangement in the way collagen molecules pack together to form fibrils. So collagen molecules will start in one position, uh, sort of like this, and then in a distance of 67 nanometers, the next collagen molecule will begin, and this first collagen molecule at that point will have moved out of position to a, to a new lattice spot. Um, and then in 67 nanometers, another collagen molecule begins, and so on and so forth. Um, and then to make a fibril, we have this packing arrangement that's just uh, repeated, where we have another similar ordering of collagen molecules uh, that stacks on top like this, and then another and another like this. Um, and what's, what's, really, um, what's really notable here is the regularity of this packing arrangement. Um, and so collagen fibrils can be described as sort of quasi-crystals, uh, a crystal being um, a, a small, or a crystal being a structure that is composed of a repeated arrangement of regular assemblies, okay, or a repeated arrangement of uh, structural units. So if you look at the structure of uh, the arrangement that I've drawn here, you'll notice that in some positions moving uh, down, there's um, a collagen molecule missing um, in these repeated groups of molecules that I've put up. And then in the adjacent segments, um, there's, there's not that uh, missing collagen molecule, and that's due to the, the gap between the, the end of one molecule and the start of another. And this is, this is what gives uh, collagen fibrils their striated debanding -band, D appearance. Um, or striated appearance that we call D-banding uh, under um, an electron microscope when you when you see them. So that's um, that's always a hallmark structural feature of collagen fibrils is this this D-banded arrangement, and it comes from this very regular uh, quasi-crystalline packing of collagen molecules within the fibrils. Okay, um, now of course for, for an assembly like this to uh, become competent at bearing tensile load, the molecules need to be linked to one another. And this is done by intermolecular cross-linking, which I'm showing here just by these yellow sort of bars uh, linking adjacent molecules together. So we'll, we'll talk a, a little bit uh, more about that. I'm not sure if we'll get to it, uh, in today's lecture, but um, if not, we'll talk about it in, um, in the next lecture on Wednesday. Okay, um, so that's, that's a bit of, uh, you know, the crash course in um, collagen structure. And now we need to do um, a little bit of mechanics before we um, start talking about tissue mechanics. And, and in particular, um, if we're gonna talk about tissue mechanics, you need to know what stress is and you need to know uh, what strain is. So let's talk about both of those uh, two different concepts here for a moment. 
Um, so this is this is going to be um, just nothing to do with tissues right now. We'll just look at the mechanics and then we'll bring the tissues back into it. So just a really simple explanation here of what stresses. So if you can imagine uh, us having um, a cylinder that's sitting on the ground and a load F being applied to the top of it. So some force F. Um, this object here, we're gonna say is uh, static. So it's not moving. Um, it's got no acceleration. Acceleration is zero. Uh, we know that force and acceleration are related by F equals MA. So if the acceleration is zero and the product of mass and acceleration is zero, that means that the net force acting on this object has to be equal to zero. In other words, the sum of the forces acting on the object has to be zero. And that's true not just for the whole object by itself, but any section of this object that we want to consider in isolation. So um, if we wanted to consider what the internal force here was on some cross-sectional plane of interest, we could isolate just that portion of the object here like this, right? And this has some cross-sectional area A. So this is the cross-sectional area there. Okay, so force on the top here for this portion of the object to remain in static equilibrium, then the sum of the forces acting on this piece of the larger object has to be equal to zero. So we need to have an internal force F uh, acting upwards on that section plane. And of course you intuitively knew that, right? Because uh, you know if you press down on a column with force F, that force F is transmitted throughout the entire length so that any position in that column is going to have force F acting within it. So what stress is, stress is just a measure of average internal force acting on a particular uh, plane in an object, okay? So stress is average internal force, right? And what we can say is that to get stress, um, which we uh, denote by the Greek letter lowercase sigma, stress there. All we do is we take the force acting over an internal area and divide it by that cross sectional area. So F divided by A is our stress. Um, let's take a minute and look at what the units uh, are there. So if we put some square brackets around there to denote that we're going to show units over here, we've got force measured in newtons, uh, cross-sectional area here measured in meters squared, and that's uh, Pascal. Okay. Now, um, the nice thing about stress is that um, average internal force, right? A, a certain material will be able to withstand a certain um, average internal force. And by taking force and dividing it by cross-sectional area to get stress, we, we account for the fact that um, objects of different cross-sectional area um, subjected to different internal forces uh, we, we can compare the internal force within those then. So if we take, let's say a column here, it's a different one that has an internal 
cross-sectional area of instead 2a so twice the cross-sectional area of our original column and it's under two times the applied load then the stress within this column in that cross-sectional plane is going to be 2f divided by 2a right f divided by a exactly the same stress as in the smaller column right so it allows us to compare um, the internal force within objects of different sizes okay so that's that's your that's your very brief um, introduction to what stress is okay so now we'll talk about uh, what strain is so just like um, stress is related to force strain is a parameter that we relate to changes in length that an object under load experiences. Okay, so let's look at our, um, our same column here. There we go, under uh, some load F. Now, all of, all of the materials that, if you look around you, right, all, all of the materials that you see around you, or most of them, um, are, are actually springs. Um, and, and they're just very, very stiff springs, which is why we don't think of them uh, as springs. Um, but we're going to represent this column just here as a spring like this. There we go. So under load F, this column that is originally length L long, of course, if you apply a force to something, it's going to, or a compressive force to something, it's going to shorten a little bit. So this column is going to uh, shorten by some length delta L, right? Because this spring here is under force F on the top, force F on the bottom, compressing it is going to shorten a little bit. So now the question becomes, okay, well, how does the change in length compare if we have um, a column of the same material, but that is twice as long, right? Um, so here, let's make one that's sort of twice as long like this. Okay, so instead of one spring, this is going to be composed of two of these springs in pair or in series together, one after the other. There we go. So we'll say that this is length L and that is also uh, length L. Okay, so if we apply, apply the same load F to the top of this column, this spring here is carrying force F within it, so it's going to shorten by the same amount as this spring, delta L, right? There is delta L. This spring has that same force traveling within it, right? It's subjected to that same compressive force F, so it's also going to shorten by delta L. So even though these columns are under the same compressive force, the second column is going to undergo twice the length change that the first column does because the second column is twice as long, right? But per unit length, both columns, both columns are shortening by the same amount. So we use strain to normalize change in length to original length to give a measure of the per unit length change in um, change in dimensions that an object uh, undergoes. So strain. We give the symbol uh, Greek letter epsilon here, and we define strain as the change in length over an object's original length. Okay, change in length over original length. So for the first column here, we've got strain is change in length over original length. 
for the second column here, strain, right? Our change in length is two delta L, one delta L for each spring. Our original length is two L, so our strain is delta L over L. Same value as the first column here, okay? All right, so now you know about um, both stress and strain. You know what those, you know, you know what I'm saying when I say stress and strain or when uh, we look at plots now that have uh, stress and strain included within them. All right, let's clean this up a little bit here. And again, um, feel free to feel free to just to shout out, you know, unmute yourself, shout out if you have any questions. Or, uh, or pop them in the chat there. Okay, great. Okay, so um, now that we know what stress and strain is, let's look at um, what the mechanical response of um, regular sort of engineering materials like metals are before we look at what the mechanical response of tissues uh, look like. Um, so here's a, here's a hip implant here. Um, quite commonly, uh, these implants are made out of um, alloys like uh, titanium, uh, aluminum, uh, vanadium. Uh, TI6AL4V is, is a pretty common one. Um, great, great strength, nice and light, uh, great corrosion resistance. Um, and most metals um, have uh, an atomic structure that is, is crystalline, so it's made up of a repeating arrangement of, um, of very regularly ordered atoms. So here, this is supposed to be um, a zoomed in look at the atomic structure of that titanium alloy that that, um, that hip implant is made of. Now, most of the atoms here, right, which are very uh, regularly positioned would be uh, the titanium atoms. And then you've got some substitutions here where um, an aluminum atom would take the place of a titanium atom and then other ones where um, a vanadium would take the place of a titanium, uh, but and a, and a few sort of smaller interstitial uh, um, alloying elements in here. But overall, a very regular uh, atomic structure, okay? So let's look at what the response of a metal is like this when you apply, let's say, a tensile load. So when you when you stretch um, a piece of, uh, of metal like titanium, aluminum, vanadium. So we characterize the mechanical properties of, uh, of materials by looking at their stress strain response. So we put strain, right, which is our change in length over the material's unloaded length on the x-axis. And did I say stress strain? Um, and stress on the vertical axis where we've got force divided by cross-sectional area. Um, now, metals have um, a very linear stress strain response at the start, right? Um, this should be more of a linear line. We can do better than that, right? And then they sort of uh, curve over like that and then we won't talk about the rest of the curve uh, there. But the point is um, that the initial um, initial response between stress and strain is linear and we define the slope of this stress strain response here um, as the material's modulus of elasticity, which we give the symbol uh, big E. It's like the stiffness of the material. So uh, how much uh, force does it take it does it take to elongate it by a certain amount? OK. 
Okay, so this is the modulus of elasticity. Okay. So the relationship between um, stress and strain here with this being a linear line starting at the origin where we have zero stress and zero strain is simply that the modulus of elasticity is stress divided by strain or written a different way, stress equals modulus of elasticity multiplied by strain. So this is this is exactly the same expression as uh, the spring equation, F equals K uh, X or K delta X, um, both referred to as Hooke's law. It's just we take the, the spring equation, F equals K X, and normalize the variables to the dimension of the original object to get uh, sigma equals modulus of elasticity times uh, epsilon, or stress equals modulus of elasticity times strain, okay? So for metals, metals tend to have um, a, quite a high modulus of elasticity. For that, um, titanium, aluminum, vanadium, we're gonna have a modulus of elasticity of about uh, 120 gigapascals, okay? So 120 times 10 to the nine pascals. Um, and the, the limit of that linear response between stress and strain, that's what we refer to as the yield stress, and that's gonna be uh, about 925 megapascals, 925 million pascals, just to give you a sense of, uh, some, of some of the values for these materials here, okay? So the story for metal, um, very, very stiff material um, and uh, high strength as well. And the reason the material is so stiff is because when, when you load a metal like this in tension, you are directly stretching the atomic bonds between um, titanium atoms in this case, or titanium and, uh, and aluminum here, titanium and vanadium down here, you're directly stretching atomic bonds and it's very, very hard or it takes a lot of force to, um, to stretch those bonds. So you get a very, very stiff material. Okay, so now that we've got the basics there covered, now we can um, go on to talk about tissues, but, but first you might be wondering uh, what happens um, above this point, and that's, that's this graphic here. So um, above this point here, the yield point, if we go further in the curve, we start getting slips between planes of atoms, um, slip, they're called slip planes, um, and, um, and so that's what happens, uh, that's what happens next. Okay, so let's talk about um, the stress-strain response of collagen tissues now. And we're gonna, we're gonna focus on tendon here because uh, tendon is the, architecturally, um, the most basic of the, uh, of the collagenous tissues in terms of structure. Okay. All right, so this is, this is sort of um, um, a shortened structural hierarchy of how tendon is assembled um, from, from collagen or how, uh, how collagen uh, is assembled to form, form a tendon. So we have, we have the molecules, the collagen molecules, uh, that we talked about, um, forming these, uh, these fibrils here that are the, the D-banded structures there. And tendon is really um, largely a uniaxial arrangement of collagen fibrils packed next to one another. So um, collagen fibrils pack parallel to one another to form uh, the next higher level, um, fascicles. And um, here, here you can see uh, a, a picture, an electron micrograph of a bunch of collagen fibrils packed together showing that sort of uniaxial parallel arrangement. 
And um, at, the, at the fascicle level, what's notice, notable is that um, the, the collagen develops this sort of this waveform uh, crimp here. Um, that's, that's, that's a crimp on the order of microscale. You can see it with your, um, just with your eyes when you, when you look at a tendon. Um, and then we have multiple fascicles that uh, come together to, uh, to make, make a tendon. Um, so let's look at the way that um, a, a tendon responds to tensile load. And we'll talk, we'll, I'll, I'll, draw the, um, I'll draw the stress strain or the tensile stress strain response for a tendon here. And then we'll talk about um, the mechanisms that give rise to the different portions of the stress strain curve, okay? So unlike, unlike a metal, um, the stress strain response of a tendon does not start out linear. linear. It has this sort of uh, this low stiffness portion at the bottom and then it curves upward into a linear region and then rolls over like that ending in uh, rupture up here. So this is the stress strain response for a tendon. And so what we'll do is we'll break this stress strain response up into, uh, into different segments and talk about uh, the mechanisms that give rise to this, um, this stress strain curve here. So we're gonna say that we're gonna have one region there and one region there one region here and one region there. Okay, so we'll just label these region one, region two, region three, and region four there. Okay, so um, in this first region here, this region is called the toe region of the stress strain response. We've got toe and heel because they sort of, you know, curve up like a, like a foot there. Um, so in the toe region, um, what happens is that this microscale waveform crimp that exists at both the fascicle level and also at the tendon level, uh, that flattens out when you start applying a tensile load to a tendon. And it takes very little applied force to flatten out that, that waveform crimp. You can imagine that we've got, if you look at something uh, from the side view here, if you've got something that's sort of uh, corrugated or waveform like that, a piece of material, and you take it and you apply a load, it takes very little load to straighten that out if, if the material is flexible to, uh, to start with, right? If you've got a corrugated steel sheet, of course, you need to apply a little bit more force to, uh, to pull it straight. But if you've got something that's uh, flexible, like a, like a tendon, then it takes very little load to straighten it out here. And you can actually um, see this happen um, if you apply load to a piece of tissue um, under an optical microscope. So uh, this, is, this is a device for, uh, for doing just that, a little micro uh, tensile stretcher here um, that's being uh, instrumented with um, with a strain gauge to measure force on one side and then has a little window where the tissue goes and you can, you can watch the tissue as you pull on it, um, observe it as, as well as getting a simultaneous stress strain curve. So when you do something like that, you, uh, you go from having um, a tissue that when it, it's not under load has this sort of lovely uh, waveform crimp to it to something that's that's very straight, okay, and and has that uh, crimp removed. So that takes us 
through this, uh, this initial low modulus toe region. All right, so thinking about the, um, the heel region, after we get that crimp waveform straightened out, then it becomes a little bit harder to elongate um, a tendon. And the stress starts increasing a little bit more as we apply additional incremental strain. So a new mechanism of, um, of deformation takes effect in this heel region. So region two is the heel region. So this region is largely governed by um, the response of collagen at the, at the fibril level now. Um, if you look in this, this, this figure that we sort of had up before showing um, these space filling representations of, of collagen molecules, you can see that in this region right through here where, um, where there's that gap between um, one collagen molecule ending and the next collagen molecule starting over here. They're, the molecules are actually quite, um, quite bendy uh, within, within there. And you actually have the molecules straightening out in this region of the stress strain curve uh, here during, during this portion. And you, you can observe this under optical microscopy um, like you can with microscale crimp because um, those, those nanoscale collagen fibrils and molecules are just, just too small to, um, to observe with light. But what you can do is you can look at them using um, x-ray diffraction and actually see that straightening out of collagen molecules um, in the x-ray diffraction spectra. So x-ray diffraction might not be might not be something that you're familiar with so we'll just go over like the, the very basics of that. Um, so this is this is the classic sort of two uh, slit experiment that shows um, how how waves interfere with one another. So you've got a source here that's producing, um, a wave and it goes and encounters a plate here which has uh, two small slits in it. And out of those two small slits come um, two new waves. And you can see where these waves are going to constructively interfere uh, with one another. So if we take a line, for example, along that arrow, you can see that those uh, the crests of those two waves and these lines um, are sort of indicating if, if we think about these waves as um, as you know being uh, a wave in water or something just to just to make things easy to think about then then the lines represent the crests of the waves and where the lines meet um, you're going to get the waves constructively interfering to produce a wave of greater amplitude. Okay, so that line marks where the crests of some of these, some of the waves meet. And if we take um, uh, the reading at a certain position of where those uh, constructive interferences happen, then we can see um, through this line that we're going to get the waves uh, constructively interfering um, at that point there. And then similarly, Right, you can you can draw other lines here um, to point out or map out where the crests of waves are going to constructively interfere uh, with one another. So you get uh, two lines uh, like that, and then you can get two more lines like that, and and so on and so forth. And um, there's there's a very easy equation that you can use to. Um, Based, based on the measurement of where these constructive interferences occur um, to figure out how far apart these two slits are. OK, 
Okay, so if we call this distance between these two slits, uh, I'm gonna put on my uh, glasses here so I can see a little bit better. Okay. Okay, if we call the uh, distance between those slits, uh, distance D there, and the distance between that plate and the spot where we are measuring uh, some length L, then we can measure here the, the angle between the line here and the point of constructive interference here, theta, and the equation that we get is um, d sine theta is related to m lambda, where here lambda is the wavelength of, of the wave, uh, d the spacing of the slit, sine theta, the angle that um, our point of constructive interference makes with the uh, straight line passing through here, and m is the, uh, the, the order, what's called the order of the point of constructive uh, interference. So uh, this point of constructive interference uh, there is the, the zero order point and then the first order and the second order, etc. So the whole the whole point being is it's very easy to use this equation to uh, calculate what the distance d is between the slits here. So if we talk about um, tendon now instead, because of the the very regular ordering of collagen in a tendon. Um, a tendon can do the same thing with a wave that, um, that happens with that double slit experiment. So we've got a piece of tissue, let's say, like this, and it's composed of a bunch of collagen fibrils in parallel. So it behaves like a diffraction grating. So when you have light of the right wavelength incident upon it, and you need to use x-rays to do this, then you can get that light diffracting off to give you a diffraction pattern, uh, which allows you then, if you know the distance between your detector and your piece of tissue. So that's that distance L that we had in the previous diagram. And then you measure the angle here, theta. Uh, then you can figure out what the distance is between the structures that are causing um, the diffraction, right? So what we find when, when we do an experiment like this, and here in this figure, uh, you can sort of see how, how an experiment like this works, where you've got um, a synchrotron uh, light source here, uh, providing or producing uh, very, very high intensity x-rays, and then you pass them through a piece of tendon that's under load, and you measure the diffraction spectra in, um, in a detector here, uh, measure the actual distances uh, between the pattern that you get and back calculate the distance between, in, in this case, molecules. Right. Um, and what you can get is you can get a plot of the intensity of that diffraction spectra, so how um, how bright these points are, which tells you uh, how many molecules in this case are, um, are, are producing 
the the spectra that you uh, that you get. So as you get more molecules um, that are in line with one another, uh, you produce a more intense uh, intense diffraction spectra. Um, and you can see how that changes as you apply load to the tissue. Okay, so on the uh, vertical axis here, you've got intensity, um, and then you've got time down that axis, and then on this axis here, you've got this strain that's being applied to the tissue, so change in length over original length. And you can see that as, um, as you apply strain to the tissue, um, the intensity of the diffraction peak goes goes up. So that means that, um, or that's that's an indication that your molecules, and collagen molecules, are going from being uh, slightly disordered to uh, more ordered. So you're getting um, a more intense uh, response because of the ordering of, of collagen molecules. Okay, so that's sort of <laughs> captured uh, more nicely than, than my uh, sketches in this, this figure right here. And, um, and you can see here the things that we've talked about so far. So the crimp, the microscale crimp in the tissue being lost and straightened out as we move through the toe region and then through the heel region above uh, here, this is this is a picture of those collagen molecules, right? Um, with with the sort of the wiggly areas here, where um, where you've got that space between where one molecule ends and the next molecule starts, and through the heel region that sort of straightens out, right? So the molecules come more into alignment, and that's what occurs through the heel region here. So we've got two crimp. Got the crimp straightening and the heel, we've got molecular kinks. Molecular kinks straightener. Okay. All right, so that takes us up into uh, the linear region of the stress strain curve. And in the linear region, what starts to happen, you can sort of see it um, over, over here between these two uh, panels, is that the molecules, the collagen molecules, actually start to slide relative to one another within fibrils, okay? So the molecules are extending, uh, or sliding relative to one another uh, with, within fibrils. Okay, so that doesn't um, that doesn't fully explain um, all of the the processes that are going on, though, in this region. Um, so here we've got uh, molecules thin fibril sliding. Okay, if you look at these plots over here, uh, we've got one that's tension and strain, right? And then this lower plot here is the change in uh, D period strain versus percent elongation of the tissue. Um, so the, the D period strain is that length difference between where one molecule in a fibril starts and the next one, or one where one ends and the next one starts or between starts of uh, two adjacent molecules, that's 67 nanometer distance, nanometer distance, that is what's referred to as the D period. Um, so that's what's being plotted here on the y-axis against macroscopic strain. And what, what you'll note here, first of all, in the heel region, 
of the stress strain curve, you can see that there is no change in the D period of the fibrils, okay? Um, so no change in the D period, that's because the molecules haven't started sliding relative to one another within fibrils uh, yet, because as we talked about, crimp straightening, uh, molecular kinks are straightening there. Once you reach the end of the heel region, then you start to see an increase in the D period, okay? But the notable thing is that for any strain that we look at, let's say 10% macroscopic strain, that's 10% strain on the tendon, the corresponding strain on the fibrils is much lower, only about eh, 40% of that. So overall, the tissue is lengthening more than fibrils are lengthening. And so that's an indication that there is a lot of slippage between fibrils happening in this linear region of the stress strain curve. So we have molecules within fibrils sliding relative to one another, but we also have fibrils sliding relative to one another as well. And this, um, this has been used to come up with some um, structural schematics for how uh, tendons are actually composed or how the fibrils in tendons um, are, are laid out to, to give the, the structure of tendons. We already talked about them being um, parallel to one another, uh, but there's always been the question of, you know, do, do collagen fibrils run all the way through tendon from bone at one end all the way to their connection uh, to the muscle on the other end, or are they discontinuous? And this, this previous sort of data uh, indicates that, you know, there, there's a lot of sliding between collagen molecules, so maybe they're discontinuous. So here, um, structure has been inferred from, from mechanics. And so in the proposed structure that, that these authors came up with, they have uh, fibrils represented as sort of short segments within a tendon that are sort of... Um, uh, transmitting force between one another through uh, through proteoglycans um, that are that are transmitting uh, forces via shear from from one to to another. Um, you you might wonder um, why people are trying to infer structure from from mechanics. Well, that that's because. Um, for, for a tissue like a uh, tendon that's, that's composed of collagen fibrils, it's very hard to uh, actually directly investigate um, a question of, of whether collagen fibrils are continuous along the length of tendon. It's, it's funny, you know, it's, it's, you know we, we, we do, we do um, so many interesting technological things, right? It's, it's sometimes it's surprising to hear that uh, some basic questions about your, um, your anatomy are, are still unanswered, like whether the collagen fibrils that make up your tendons, um, like, you know, the tendons that you can see on the, the top of your hands if you uh, extend your fingers upwards, whether the collagen fibrils that make up those tendons are actually continuous along the length of the tendon or uh, whether, whether they're discontinuous. Um, so the, the state of the art way of structurally investigating uh, something like this is to use what's called um, serial block face scanning electron microscopy. So this is this is an electron microscope that um, that combines also a microtome, a microtome, uh, something that you use to take thin tissue uh, sections. So um, here's the objective of, of the electron microscope or the the X-ray source um, in this case. Um, and uh, and you've got the, the tissue block down here and a microtome blade. And what you do is you image the surface of your tissue block, you take a layer off and then you re-image, take a layer off, re-image, take a layer off, re-image. 
And by doing this, um, you, get, you get these two-dimensional images um, like this, where you can segment out the different fibrils that exist. Um, and then in subsequent images, you can use particle tracking software to build up a three-dimensional picture of how the fibrils uh, move through, through the tissue. And this is, this is really state-of-the-art um, stuff here. But e even using this, this best equipment that we currently have, it's still difficult to uh, get, get a picture of how fibrils um, run through a tendon because the longest tendon that um, researchers have been able to image in its entirety using this technology is the trapedius tendon from, or the stapedius tendon from the, uh, the middle ear of a mouse, okay? Um, so that's, that's very short, about 200, 200 microns um, long. And that, that's much, much shorter than, you know, you look at the, the tendons on top of your hand, for example, and they're, they're centimeters long. Um, so we're nowhere near uh, technologically being able to um, directly assess how long collagen fibrils are with, within our tendons. So that's why we need to rely on um, doing things like mechanical experiments to make structural uh, inferences. Okay, um, so the, the final portion of the stress strain curve, uh, region four here, um, this is the overload region, right? So this is, this is the region that you, um, that you don't want to take your tendons up into beyond the linear uh, region and this this is a region that there's you know there's still a lot of uh, unknowns about what happens um, within this region. This is actually um, quite quite a bit of where where Mike and I have um, worked has been focused on understanding what happens to collagen uh, within tendons in this overload region. And we, we've done a lot of experiments looking at, you know, how the normal structure of collagen fibrils um, changes to a very abnormal, um, deformed uh, state when, uh, when you enter this, this overload region. But we're, we're not going to really talk about that um, in these lectures at all. But just, 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 just for interest, um, I'll just, just mention that. Okay. Um, okay. So, uh, coming back to uh, coming back to our metals now for a second. I want to look now. We talked about we talked about what happens when you um, load a material in tension. Now I want to talk about what happens when you um, unload the material. Because that's also a spot where um, tissues differ, collagenous tissues differ uh, substantially from um, conventional engineering materials. So if we draw the stress strain curve again for our metal here, right, linear up to a point, the yield stress sigma y. If we remain within the linear region of the curve for um, a metal, we can load the metal up. Let's say we get to that point here. When we remove the applied loads, so let's say here's our piece of uh, metal and we're applying a tensile load F, right? We load up to this point here, which was below our yield point. Um, when we unload, the stress strain response will follow the same path back down to zero, okay? 
So load up, unload. Uh, now let's let's talk about what the significance of that is, and and to do that we need to uh, look at what the area under a stress strain curve uh, represents. Okay. So the area under the stress strain curve is what's referred to as strain energy density. It's the amount of work per unit volume that you need to put into the material to uh, cause that deformation. Okay, so let's just look at that. So the area here is the integral of what? Stress and strain, right? The integral of stress uh, with respect to uh, strain here. And that has units of stress is newtons per meter squared, right, for our Pascal. Uh, strain, we've got meters over meters. So a newton multiplied by a meter is a joule, right, energy, um, or force times a distance is work energy, units of energy, uh, and then meters cubed on the bottom. So energy per unit volume of material, okay? And this area, that's the integral of sigma dE, that's referred to as strain energy density. Okay, so um, loading, right, we need to put in some amount of energy per unit volume of material to achieve that stretch to our strain of epsilon. But then during unloading, that energy is fully, fully recovered. Um, so this material is what's referred to as a perfectly elastic material because it behaves just like a rubber band. You know, you stretch it, um, let it go, it returns to its original length. Stretch it again, let it go, it returns to its, its, its original length. Um, the energy that we put in is elastically stored and recovered upon unloading. Let's look at um, the situation for a tendon, then, because the tendon behaves quite differently. All right, let's draw our stress strain curve for tendon again. So we've got that's referred to as a J-shaped stress strain curve. And let's say, here's the rest of it up here. Let's say just like the, uh, the metal, we stop somewhere in the linear region and uh, don't go up to this point where the stress strain curve stops becoming linear here. So this is our loading curve there. So we're loading up to this point here, some strain epsilon. Because the different mechanisms that occur to produce the stress strain curve of this shape have so many um, so many mechanisms that involve sliding of different components, there is a lot of energy dissipated within uh, a tendon through internal friction as you're as you're elongating it right so you've got you've got uh, molecules straightening molecular kinks straightening and um, and molecules sort of shifting relative to one another uh, in the the linear region as well as fibrils uh, sliding past one another and that friction produces heat and results in some loss of the strain energy that you've put in to stretch the tissue. So some of this input strain energy is lost. 
So on unloading, only a portion of that strain energy is recoverable and you end up with a unloading curve that is different than the loading curve. Okay, And this, this phenomenon of um, having some of your input energy lost and non-recoverable uh, is called hysteresis. All right, so if we look um, here at the loading curve, right? There's the loading curve. If we take the area underneath that and call that area uh, U for the loading portion, right? Call the strain energy associated with that elongation um, UL. And then we look at the strain energy underneath the unloading portion of the curve. Just that bit there. So this is U for, let's say, um, unloading. Energy U, UN. Then we define the hysteresis as the difference between those. So the area contained between them, which represents the energy loss, divided by the air, the strain energy during loading um, and, uh, and converted to a percentage. So Mr. Re Right, we'll give it the symbol H is uh, the strain energy for loading minus the strain energy for unloading. UN for unloading divided by the strain energy for loading uh, multiplied by 100 to give us a number uh, in percent there. Right. Um, now, you can, you can imagine that it's, um, it's not terribly efficient for tendons to be um, losing some of the strain energy that is, um, that is put into them when they're stretched because when, when a tendon stretches, some of that strain energy uh, can be recovered during unloading to help power locomotion. And if you're losing input energy, then that, that's, that's more work that your muscles have to do to make up for that. So tendons actually have um, pretty low hysteresis, lower than let's say um, ligaments where you don't gain a lot of uh, efficiency in terms of uh, movement having, having lower hysteresis. Um, so here you can see a couple of um, example plots of, of real stress strain data from uh, tendons showing, showing hysteresis. And the hysteresis also changes depending on uh, how many times a, a tendon has been loaded. So um, cycle one here, this is, this is a tendon that was relaxed and has just been loaded for the first time and you can see that the path up and the path back down through unloading are separated by a pretty pretty substantial amount of area so a large large amount of hysteresis but by the time you've applied five loading cycles the area within that loop is much smaller and a smaller percentage of the area underneath the loading curve so so quite a small amount of hysteresis um, after after uh, you've gone through a couple of loading cycles.
and you can you can actually measure um, the uh, the effects of this energy loss due to internal friction um, by by using a temperature probe and inserting a temperature probe into into a tenon. Of course, you wouldn't want to do this um, to to a person. This is this is data from from a horse showing. Uh, first of all, the temperature probe up here that was used. And here's a plot of temperature versus time. Uh, temperature from this temperature probe, which was inserted into the horse's um, su superficial digital flexor tendon, which is sort of um, the equivalent to our Achilles tendon. Um, the temperature plot over time while the horse is doing uh, galloping exercises. So the time spent galloping is sort of that bar marked G in these two areas. And you can see as the horse starts galloping, the temperature within the tendon uh, starts increasing rather rapidly. Um, and then after the horse stops galloping, the temperature um, drops again and then, then rises, rises again. So this temperature increase is, uh, is a result of those internal uh, frictional um, processes uh, that, that, are, that are occurring. Okay. So, uh, looking at the uh, looking at the time here, we're getting uh, we're getting close to uh, uh, time. When we come back on Wednesday, uh, what we're going to look at is just you know we're gonna we're gonna take a break from sort of this stuff and actually do uh, an example problem with some numbers and look at um, the energy storage in an Achilles tendon. Um, during during running, right? So you can actually um, using basic um, sort of uh, statics and mechanics um, figure out how much energy is stored in an Achilles tendon during during running, and um, it's it's actually pretty easy to get the required data. Um, you can instrument uh, a person with. Um, these infrared sort of sensors, uh, markers on, on their skin, so you can record uh, their motion and the position of their limbs in three-dimensional space uh, in time, and then uh, have them walk over a surface that has force sensors or force plates um, in. And, and here's an example from, from BME of, um, of uh, Dr. Rutherford doing this in the um, in the dynamics of human motion lab, where he's got a, a patient or an individual um, who has some of these uh, infrared sensors on, walking over a force plate. You can sort of see those those areas in the floor there where the where the individual is walking over. So when we come back, we're going to go through a little bit of this uh, example problem on Wednesday, um, do, some, do some calculations here, and then we'll uh, talk about uh, cross-linking, and then we'll talk a bit about uh, bone, bone mechanics as well.